Communication. It's so much fun. And it can be difficult. It can be a challenge. What's interesting is what seems like a challenge, maybe even a problem, really is an opportunity. It's an opportunity for us to grow as individuals and to grow as a couple. Communication difficulties are actually, I believe, given to us by God. It's not a difficulty. It's a uniqueness. Ladies, think about it. For most of you, you have children or one day will have children. You are managing a household and a husband. You're trying to keep them in order. You're trying to keep them clothed. You're trying to keep them fed. You're trying to make sure everyone's where they need to be on time. You are juggling a million things, and you leave your kids at home with your husband, and what are you doing? You're praying. You're praying that he'll be okay, praying he'll make it, and got grandma on speed dial just in case. Because the reality is we are created, wired as individuals within marriage to do different things. Husbands, you are to lead and to protect Lead and to protect. That is your prime job in the family. For the ladies, you are the managers. Now, you're not limited by that. Don't take that the wrong way. But you manage the household. You keep things together and moving forward. And God has wired you to do that. And so it makes sense that a guy would communicate on a more minute level, a more specific level than a female. And ladies, though you do use more words, it's not a bad thing can just be a challenging thing at times. We're different. And some might ask, well, why, why does it have to be so difficult? I thought we were going to get married. Things are going to be easy and smooth and perfect. Maybe some of you are engaged and you're thinking that's the way it's going to be. Get ready, right? Why can't it just be easy? Well, here's an interesting thought. Gary Thomas, one of the pastors here on our staff, wrote a book called Sacred Marriage. Maybe you're familiar with it. And he came up with a very profound thought that ended up driving his book. He said that marriage is not a human invention to make us happy, but rather a God-ordained covenant to make us holy. What does that mean? Well, to make us better people, to make us more like Christ. When you were single, there were things you got to hide, things that were never exposed, mainly because there wasn't someone sitting across the table pointing them out to you. But then you got married and you realized you were selfish, You realize that you had some issues that you had to work out. And as you've been married, you've had to deal with those things. And guess what? By dealing with them, they've made you a better person. They've made you more like Christ. Marriage does that to us. It's actually a beautiful thing. And so in communication, we have an area that we get to work on. And there's some challenges there. And so then we think back on our wedding day when we said our coveted vows. And we made those promises to each other or for some of you coming soon. And maybe, depending on your vows and depending who did your ceremony, you might have said a phrase like this, I promise to build you up with my words. I promise to build you up with my words. And that's what we're gonna look at tonight. We're gonna look at communication, but we're really gonna look at words. And we're gonna look at how they can be powerful and how they can be toxic. And so I'm gonna encourage you with the negative, and then we'll look at the positive. What I want you to do is to not look at your spouse during this time. Just stay focused in the mirror, all right? And then you can deal with that when you get in the car. And do not blame me, okay? But let's just be honest tonight as we navigate this this challenging and tricky topic. So here's the first thing we want to look at. Let's look at some of the differences between men and women. You may not completely agree with these. That's okay. I'm on stage. You're not. Don't worry about it. First, you may have heard the phrase or the statement that women speak more than men. Does anybody agree with that statement? Some of you are like, I'm not, this is crazy. Put your hand in your pocket. They actually say that women speak about 20,000 words a day and men speak about seven. How many of you agree with that? Actually, it's a myth. It's a myth. That's right. Now, the reason it's a myth is because no one's ever been actually able to prove that amount of words came out of anyone's mouth. Uh, Anytime they've done this study, it's always been with young children, three to five years old. I'm not sure why they did that, but that's how they've done this study. So when I looked at it, I said, I'm not going to use this because this is not good evidence. However, I think we could all agree that ladies tend to speak more than men, right? Okay. Guys, you got to help me out here. I feel like I'm getting shot at already. We just got started, okay? We know that's true. Now, here's some other differences that are actually important. Husbands, 
You believe that communication should have a clear purpose. Amen? You are a little more responsive than the last room. Wives, you see communication as an act of sharing and building intimacy. Hmm, that means yes. Husbands, you often like to make decisions independently. Ladies, be careful. But the wives tend to seek advice, input, and consensus. This is why ladies are often right and men are often lost. Just for free. Husbands, you listen actively, meaning you are expecting your job is to solve the problem, to find a solution. I like that. However, wives, you see conversation as a productive end in and of itself. Sheer talking is helping you come to your conclusion. Guys, if you're not writing this down, gentlemen, this is your moment here. I'm helping you out. Just Husbands, when you're feeling down, you withdraw into your quote-unquote cave. You want to be quiet. You want to be alone. Ladies, when you're feeling down, you use words to explore and express your emotions. Maybe not all of you. Husbands, in conversation, you're more focused on the outer world, business, sports, the news. But wives... You tend to be more focused on the interpersonal things, the things happening inside. I made an observation. Do not quote me on this. This is not an official statement. I just was thinking, which is kind of dangerous sometimes, but I was thinking, ladies are often described as the ones that gossip. Careful, let me finish. That, right? Is that, is that true? If, if you're going to have, guys aren't really in the category of gossiping. It's typically, but I was thinking about this. And you know, you know why I think that happens or why you're categorized that way? It's because the things you talk about are just more personal. It may not always be intentional. It's just a more personal conversation. Okay, let's move on. Sarah's like, stop thinking. Just do your thing. Let's look at some toxic words. Let's look at some toxic words. Here's some things we want to be careful of, things we want to look out for. Number one, sarcastic words. Things like, the lawn isn't going to mow itself. You're welcome it rained today. Or maybe things like, what am I, your maid? Now, I wouldn't use any of those, by the way, going forward from now on. But here's what I want to point out to you just on this thought. Sarcasm, the actual root word that makes this up, where we get its foundation, if you were to literally translate it, it is the term to tear flesh. To tear flesh. Isn't that interesting? Because we know if you've around sarcastic people, it could hurt, even though it's always a joke. It could hurt. I remember when I met my wife, she almost didn't like me. You know why? Because I was so sarcastic. Some of you are like that. It's kind of how you're funny. It's how you cut jokes. I do it even up here. So it just comes out, and I go, oh, I bring that back. I don't know why I said that. It just comes out of me. And I remember when she met me, she said, oh, well, she did not like me at all because I was so sarcastic. And when we think about where it comes from and we think about the the tearing of flesh, we can realize, hey, every once in a while you crack a joke, okay. But over time, the more you say it, the more you do it, the more it cuts, the more it rips, and the more it hurts. Unsupportive words. Things like, oh, that's a crazy idea. Why would you do that? Hopefully you've never said that, but maybe. If your husband was about to jump off the roof into the pool, that might be a phrase you would use. You really think you can do that? Now, we know there's, an, there's some value in a wife or a husband helping keep each other safe and alive, right? But the reality is we want to be found as supportive. We want to be encouraging. We want to know that our spouse has got our back. Our spouse is on our side no matter what, unless it's dumb. Then they're going to help us keep on track. But we want to be supportive. We want our spouse to be our biggest fan, not our biggest critic. That's important. And so we want to use words that are supportive, and we want to be careful of the unsupportive ones. Disrespectful words. Respect is such a powerful thing in marriage, and particularly for men. We're gonna dig into this a little bit more in the weeks to come, but but ladies, respectful words to your husband is one of the most fulfilling things they're going to hear. And so by default, when we're disrespectful, we have to be careful. You might say things like, hypothetically, of course, can't you find a real job? Or, careful here, you've really been putting on some weight. These would be words that would be better strategically said 
or not at all, but that's just for you to decide. Comparing words, comparing words. Things like, well, Chad would never do that. The answer is he probably would, first of all, so don't use that. But Chad would never do that. Or why can't you just be more like Sarah? Why can't you just be more like Mary? Why can't you just be more like anybody but yourself? Comparing words, what they say is you're not good enough. We gotta be careful. Some of these come out naturally. We don't think about it. Sometimes we get so comfortable over time with each other that these things are coming out, coming out, and we don't even realize it because we've just been around each other so long and we're so comfortable. We have to be so careful comparing words. And finally, selfish words. Selfish words. I want this. I want that. Selfish people tend to start a conversation with I, I. These are five areas, five types of words that we want to be on the lookout for. We see how words can be deadly. We see how they can be toxic. But words can also be powerful. Words can also build us up and encourage us. Let's look at five powerful types of words. First, respectful words. We know we don't want to be disrespectful, but we want to be respectful. This is a fulfilling thing. This is a way we honor our spouse and not undermine them. Being respectful. Affirming words. You did a great job. I'm so impressed with how you cut the yard in two hours. That was amazing. We could have paid someone for it. No, I'm just kidding. All right, we want affirming words. This is so great. I think about, um, I, I'm constantly teaching here. And uh, when I know that Sarah is in the room and I come home, I'm always kind of just secretly waiting for her to go, good job. Doesn't matter what any of you think. As long as she said, good job. And sometimes she doesn't say anything. And my mind starts, oh, was it that bad? Was it that bad? It didn't even get worse? Oh, my goodness, I got to start all over. What did I do? Lord, please. Affirming words, they're so powerful. Remember, the longer we're married, the older we get, the more comfortable we become, the less we tend to do these things. So we've always got to be working, whether we're in a new marriage or we're just starting out or we've been married for 50 years. These are things we want to continue to work on. Affirming words. Caring words. I'm sorry to hear that. Tell me more. You didn't see that in the video. Tell me more. Tell me about that. Not trying to solve the problem, but listening. Caring words are always centered in a time of face-to-face communication. There was a couple I heard about recently that they had heard a a talk or an encouragement on marriage and they were talking about how when you're speaking with your spouse, you wanna put your phone away, you wanna turn off the TV, any kind of distraction. And so the next couple days, the husband noticed that his wife was starting to talk to him, so he put his phone away, turned off the TV and locked in eye contact with her and she freaked out. (laughs) What are you doing? This is uncomfortable, why are you looking at me like that? I'm just trying to listen, babe. See, it's funny. If you try this at home, you might feel the same way. This is so uncomfortable. Why are you looking at me like, turn on the TV and then listen to me. But the reality is it's a testament to how far we've come or maybe how far we've gone where our communication is always semi-distracted. And so caring words are usually rooted in some form of a face-to-face time. Encouraging words. Encouraging words. Truett Cathy from Chick-fil-A. He was talking a conversation with a guy one time, and he asked the guy, how do you know someone needs encouragement? The guy was speaking to felt like it was some form of a trick question, so he just said, I don't know, what's the answer to it? And he said, if they're breathing, if they're breathing. What a great statement. If you're breathing, you are probably in need of encouragement. Now, some of us, depending on how we grew up, how we were raised, we have maybe some thicker skin. We've been through a lot, and so we're a little bit tougher. But at the end of the day, all of us love, enjoy, and need encouragement to keep moving forward. This is how we motivate our spouse to keep going. This is how we encourage them in the tough times to make it through. We want to use encouraging words. And then finally, appreciative words. We want to say thank you. We want to make sure they don't feel taken for granted. The longer you're married, the harder this is. You've got to constantly be working at this. One thing that Sarah does for me, which is amazing, I'm sorry if this doesn't happen for you, she cooks dinner every night, unless she's out of town. Every night, and I don't know what to do with myself when she's gone, by the way. Uh, Every night, and not only does she cook dinner, it's good, really good, all right? Some of you can attest if you've been over for dinner. I mean, it's good food, and you know what happens? I've become so comfortable with it because it happens almost every night that I forget to say thank you sometimes. 
In fact, sometimes, I hate to be, I hate to say it, sometimes I'll get frustrated with something simple, not realizing that she's cooked this amazing meal. In fact, sometimes I'll eat it so quickly that it's almost an insult to how much time she spent making it. That's a testament that it's good, babe, by the way, just write that down. But just saying, and so we want to make sure that we're always saying thank you, and we're not taking for granted each other because it's an incredible gift God's given us to have one another. And so what we've seen, we have these words that can be powerful, and we have these words that can be toxic. We have words that can build our marriage and grow our marriage and encourage us, and words that can be deadly. So if you're struggling with toxic words, I want to give you an encouragement tonight. I want to encourage you, maybe not right now, but when you get home tonight or tomorrow, to pull your wife or your husband aside and apologize. You say, I'm, I'm, you know what? One of those areas, you know it, but I know it too. That's me, and I'm sorry. But I want to work on that, and I want you to help me do that. The first step is getting it out in the open so that we can get it removed and we can move forward. Toxic words, we probably all could identify an area of this that we could do better at. Powerful words, we want to aim for. We want to keep working on. We want to keep encouraging each other with it because this is the thing that will push us through the good times and the bad. The best way for us to look at it is think of every word like you're building a house. Every word is a brick that you're putting in, strategically placed. And that house can be beautiful and lovely and sturdy or that house can be barely hanging on depending on the words that we use. This is a powerful area and we want to honor that vow of loving our husband and loving our wife and building them up with our words.